Good evening, guys. Check, check, check. Good evening, guys. So, I'd like to indulge my penchant for the science fiction tonight. I hope you guys enjoy it, too. I'm fascinated by, well, both, really both ends of the spectrum. Um, I enjoy looking into the origins of our consciousness and those features about us that really, really make us different than the animals. And Probably in a similar vein, I enjoy the brilliant speculators of our future, which is what tonight's video is going to be centered around. The Kardashev scale is a scale used to define the technological advancements of civilizations proposed by Russian astrophysicist Nikolai Kardashev. Scale has originally, rather, had three categories. Type 1 was also called a uh, planetary civilization. And it's defined by their ability to store all of the energy which reaches its planet from its parent star. So a type 2 is, as you can imagine, scaled up. It's called stellar civilization and they're defined by their ability to harness the total energy of its planet's parent star and um, an example of this would be a Dyson sphere which we'll get into in, a, in just a little bit so the last of the um, typical ones, the traditional um, definition of the scale is a type 3, which is a galactic civilization. It's where, as you can imagine, again, th this is a civilization that is so advanced and has obviously conquered the ability to break the light barrier. Um, or else it would at least be tens of millions of years in the making. It's crazy to think about this, but it's actually able to control the energy of an entire galaxy. It's a hypothetical scale, but Nonetheless, it's um, very, very thought-provoking, so I'm going to jump right into uh, just exploring in a little more detail what these actually mean. I read this book years ago by Michio Kaku called Physics of the Impossible, and uh, in, in this book is where I originally heard about these, uh, this scale, and it's, it's, uh, it's just to me, it's, it's like we, um, as a, as a civilization, I was just listening to Terrence McKenna earlier today, and, uh, for as much radical speculation, speculation he does, he, is a very learned person. Is that how you say it? He 
he, um, he was talking about the analogy of our own lives scaled up to our entire species and that old adage that if you don't define your own narrative in your life, you're going to become a bit player. You're bound. Um, I would say it's it's a pretty solid, um, pretty irrefutable rule that uh, you're going to be a bit player in someone else's story, someone else's drama. And that goes for our entire human species. In the case that we ever meet another alien race, if we don't have a clearly defined goal of what it is we, what our purpose is, and where we're going, and, and what we intend to do, and kind of like Star Trek, you can have a, a vague, you can leave the precise um, you can leave the goal vaguely defined as long as you parameterize it correctly so the goal for them was just to learn and meet learn from and meet new alien species and uh, if all interesting objects really for that matter in the process of exploring yet they had the um, prime directive which was uh, am I getting confused but they had rules that established how to act and um, what not to do and certain rules and boundaries that could not be transgressed um, I think theorizing about these types of future future scenarios is important for that reason and um, it's also important I guess if I wasn't too specific there it's for the reason that if we have a true encounter with an alien race we aren't led astray um, because Lord knows for all the good that we do, we're very much capable of evil and um, steering people astray. And not necessarily being forthright. So uh, I, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to imagine a violent, um, malintentioned. So let's um I guess I gotta oh explain the, the the imagination um so if we were prepared were very uh, unified in our ideas about where it is we're going as a species and I think of course right now our, our um, main goal should be to eradicate absolute poverty um, so once we're there what do we do with ourselves you know if uh, we ever reach an instance such as Star Trek where um, nobody necessarily has to have a job and people engage in science and other forms of self-improvement through challenging their skills yeah, if we ever reached that that status I think um, I think it could be easy to be led astray and uh you know, for all we know, there could be massive, um, epic intergalactic 
battles and we'd be sucked into it and uh I don't know, I guess that doesn't make too much sense because we'd just be a bit player. But nonetheless, I think it's um it's profound to think about the fact that A we are one. We have the possibility of um developing literally at this point unimaginable technology and if we don't have moral constraints on the use of that as good and as good as the intentions of using it might be we could cause chaos and uh you know do do irrevocable damage that uh, we wouldn't want so i think it's good to have discipline and uh a sense of where we're going and that's what exploring this type of uh, these these ideas these futuristic ideas in science fiction really uh, has its value and um, you know it's what is it it's um the first tentative ideas of science are always in philosophy and the first inklings of great philosophic movements can be found in pure intense passionate expressions of art whether song or music or um song or music or art paintings, drawings, such, and, uh, I love evoking our imagination, so, uh, we've reached, reached a turning point in our society, according to the renowned theoretical physicist Michio Kaku, the next hundred years of science will determine whether we perish or thrive. Will we remain a type zero civilization or will we advance and make our way into the stars? Experts assert that as a civilization grows larger, becomes more advanced, its energy demands will increase rapidly due to its population growth and the energy requirements of its various technological inventions, machines. With this in mind, the Kardashev scale was developed as a way of measuring, measuring a civilization's technological advancement based on how much usable energy it has at this, at uh, its disposal. To expand on the uh, type 1, so, I, actually I didn't mention the type 0 yet, so I want to, these, um, these scales are actually designed to be in accordance with the literal amount of energy in watts used, so a type 1 would be 10 to the 16th watts, 10 with 15 zeros after it, um, type 2 would be uh, another 10 orders of magnitude, so uh, 10 with 25 zeros on the end of that, and a type 3 would be yet another 10 orders of magnitude, so that would be good measure and thought experiments, people have actually extended it to a type 4 and a type 5. Type 4 was just another, again, 10 to the 46 watts. Type 5, though, was all the available energy in the entire universe, but we 
didn't stop there. We, uh, we said in all universes, in all time, in all timelines. So, these uh, additions consider both energy access as well as the amount of knowledge a civilization has access to. So, right now we haven't even reached the scale yet. We still sustain, sustain our energy needs from dead plants and animals, dinosaurs, fossil fuel, and um, an increasing smattering of uh, alternative energies. But we have a long way to go before being promoted to type 1. Kaku tends to believe that, all things taken into consideration, we will actually really reach a type 1 in maybe at most 200 years. So, um, when you look back, that's actually really, really quick. I think it's probably, uh, yeah, I guess that's realistic, given the the rate of transformation, but it seems optimistic if you think about 200 years ago, 18, 20, 18, 18, we were um, I guess roughly we were uh, just beginning to use the steam engine. with railroads yeah I don't know to me that's just fascinating that um, just 200 years ago we were um, not using electricity at all we were using it for kind of like um, whimsical demonstrations didn't have any combustible engines Although I have to know that. Combustible engine. When was that? Let's see. First hybrid vehicle. Seventy-seven. Nicholas Otto patents a four-stroke internal combustion engine. All right. Well, so um, yeah, we're we're advancing at a very rapid rate.
but um, yeah, nonetheless, I think it's. I'm trying to tie this into, uh, or evolving into a type one. I suppose the uh, type 2, I'll elaborate on how long it takes to get there. We theorize that type 2 might take us a few thousand years. Type 3 might take anywhere from a hundred thousand to a million years to get. So uh, that's those epic scales like the um, like Dune and uh, what's Isaac Asimov's famous one? Um, it's probably right in front of me. Foundation, the Foundation uh, saga, where uh, you know it, it, they discuss civilizations, futuristic very advanced civilizations evolving over over uh, thousands of years so Carl Sagan actually suggested um, defining intermediate values and uh based on the actual kind of logarithmic scale between the different energy usage or power usage we would apparently be about a 0.7 at this moment so let's talk about uh, just what a type 1 would mean exactly. <laughs> and well, what would that look like? Um, I guess a type one, uh, that would be the Dyson sphere. There's a lot, a lot of images um, and ideas of how to harness um, regarding how we would go about harnessing the sun's light and energy Dyson sphere would be um, would be something like uh, and uh, channel Isaac Arthur has a lot of uh, very, like actually quite a few really really quality elaborate videos with good graphics and all that explaining this in a more scientific manner but um, it could be anywhere from a, um, a series of kind of like a fragmented sphere enveloping the sun at a distance of a planet you know so maybe something like anywhere from 50 to 200 million miles away from the sun and uh, it would be able to harness all of the pretty much a significant portion of the sun's output which would of course in relation to um, other people other solar systems observations of that star it would uh, very very significantly decrease the light the actual photons emitted from that star and um, yeah it's it's one way to maybe detect that another um, of that type of civilization that maybe hasn't reached out to other stars but yet is advanced enough to build mega structures that would literally encompass the entire sphere of the star 
and it would be such a massive, massive scale. It's hard to even fathom because, I mean, the Earth is so large. It's that's hard to wrap your head around the size of the Earth that we're on right now, let alone the Sun and you know the larger planets like Jupiter. But uh, imagine an actual series of constructed objects that are that have enough volume to encompass the entire sphere of not not just the sun's local environment but a sphere at a radius literally um, thousands of times that of the sun so it'd be like try to imagine the, the sun expanded and um, just imagine the surface area even if it was fragmented you would have on that um, you'd be able to support trillions trillions and trillions of individuals with that so you could imagine that you would have to uh, God, you would have to be incredibly advanced to be able to uh, construct something that large but at the same time you would have to um, well at the same time you'd have access to that much energy I think I heard some figure before like uh, if we were able to harness a hundred percent of the sun's energy that hits just the earth which is just a pinpoint fraction of the total sun's output you know for one day we would be able to power our civilization for uh, a thousand years or some some extraordinary number such as that so how else would we what other clues would we have to know that maybe perhaps we're observing the star of a type 1 2 or well I guess not 3 because uh, that wouldn't be localized to just a star at that point in 2015, a study of galactic mid-infrared emissions came to the conclusion that the Kardashev Type III civilizations are either very rare or do not exist in the local universe. On October 14, 2015, the detection of an unusual light curve for star KIC the elegantly uh, very creatively named 8462852 like how they added that 2 at the end really makes it stick in your memory <laughs> raised the speculation that a Dyson sphere or a type 2 a uh, Oh yeah, sorry, I fucked up, I fucked up, guys. I got my uh, type 1 and 2 mixed up. So, when I was talking about Dyson Sphere just then, for the past 10 minutes, I've been uh, talking about a type, type 2 civilization. Um... Alright, they were just, sorry to make it anticlimactic, but they were just talking about SETI trying to search for a Type 2 and uh, an initial radio reconnaissance of that star, however, found no evidence. Yeah, I think what it was was uh, some abnormal dimming of the stars that they think might be due to a it wasn't a sharp dimming like that of a planet would cause but it was in fact more of a uh, a diffuse dimming that they think might have come from 
you know, an asteroid, a very dense but large asteroid cloud, perhaps a blown up, a uh, imploded planet that still maintained its orbit around the sun, but uh, was spread out to maybe encompass a third of uh, the distance of its orbit, of the circumference of its orbit. So, uh, so a type one, a large scale application of fusion power. So we got to remember not just size, but uh, more, probably more importantly, it's uh, the actual power energy usage scale that is uh, defining our civilization. So let's see. According to mass energy equivalence, type 1 implies the conversion of about 2 grams of matter to energy per second. So they were talking about the rate at which we could create energy. Type 1 implies the conversion of about 2 kilograms of matter to energy per second. And equivalent energy release could theoretically be achieved by fusing approximately 280 grams of hydrogen into helium per second rate roughly equivalent to 8.9 to the 10 um, times 10 to the 9th kilograms. Wow, okay. So, they're talking about using fusion to fuse hydrogen atoms into helium, helium atoms relative to the amount of water in our ocean, the amount of hydrogen that we have in our ocean. We could sustain life to uh, across geological time scales, which would mean millions and millions of years. And it's amazing that uh, you could even consider that, like the possibility of us actually fusing so much hydrogen that we would start using a significant portion of the amount of water we have on our planet. Which, uh, course at, at that rate, um, at that point of technological advancement, we wouldn't even need uh, the water on our planets anymore. We would no doubt have the advanced, the uh, advanced rocketry and um, other, well, fusion propulsion, I'm sure, to go and corral up some asteroids or even some large swaths of nets that uh, that might be able to pick up kind of uh, scoop up nebulous clouds of hydrogen gas that'd be cool so antimatter in large quantities would have a mechanism to produce power on a scale of several magnitudes above our current level of technology. So, in antimatter matter collisions, the entire rest mass of the particles is converted to uh, radiant energy. So, their energy. It's about four 
of one kilogram of antimatter with one kilogram of matter would produce one to the oh, 180 petajoules of energy. So some of the more interesting things that we would be able to do is harness the actual weather patterns of, um, of the entire Earth. We'd be able to affect climate. Um, I don't know how. The weather is very precarious and very chaotic. Literally chaotic. Scientifically chaotic. Um, God, we could control volcanoes, earthquakes, the weather. Obviously, ocean currents. Um, yeah, it would be amazing. Uh, what type one civilizations can do? the power of an entire star that would be where a Dyson sphere comes into play and uh, what could we do with that yeah at that point you would be yeah god there would just be so much energy there you could um, start to harness actual planets for their raw materials, such as all the gas giants for their gas f for a fusion reactions. Yeah, pretty much you're guaranteed to be immortal as a species, at least until the universe th thins out and cools down which uh, is a whole nother topic I'd like to talk about and um, make it less less rambly like this one is, but uh, less rambly than this one is. Um, it's fascinating that, uh, well, I guess that would be something that a type three civilization would be capable of, would be to harness um, black holes, the energy of black holes, because uh, at that point, well, let's see if they uh, mention anything about that in my notes here. civilizations okay you know type one would just be uh, I mean you'd be able to harness all the planetary energy 
using solar cells, solar power, wind, electro, hydroelectric, tidal, volcanic, um, tectonic energy, maybe. And um, type two, perhaps a more exotic means to generate usable energy would be to feed a stellar mass into a black hole and collect the photons emitted by the accretion disk. Less exotic would be simply to capture photons already escaping from an existing accretion disk. Um, let's see. go into the Wikipedia site and click around a little bit. Let's see what we can find. Okay. You could extract energy from a rotating black hole using uh, this uh, process theorized by Roger Penrose, a famous physicist, or the pen called the, called the uh, Penrose process. That extraction is made possible because the rotational energy of the black hole is located not inside the event horizon but on the outside of it in a reason a region called the Kerr space-time in a region of the Kerr space-time called the ergosphere what's the ergosphere Ergosphere touches the event horizon at the poles of a rotating black hole and extends to a greater radius of the equator at the equator. Oh. The equatorial or no at the equator with a low spin of the central mass, the shape of the ergosphere can be approximated by an oblate, oblate spheroid, while with higher spins, it resembles more of a pumpkin shape, kind of like two circles, um, the outline of a Venn diagram, two circles not fully whatever that was. Simulated. So, uh, a region in which, so the, the ergosphere is a region in which a particle is necessarily propelled in locomotive concurrence with the rotating space time, space time, space time. All objects in the ergosphere become dragged by a rotating space-time. In the process, a lump of matter enters into the ergosphere of the black hole, and once it enters the ergosphere, it's forcibly split into two parts. The moment of the two pieces of matter Oh, the momentum. Sorry, I thought someone fucked up. Uh, the two pieces of matter, when they separate, can be arranged so that one piece escapes from the black hole. It 
it escapes to infinity, whilst the other falls past the event horizon into the black hole. With careful arrangement, the escaping piece of matter can be made to have greater mass energy than the original piece of matter, and the infalling piece has negative mass energy. Although momentum is conserved, the effect is that more energy can be extracted than was originally provided, the difference being provided by the black hole itself. In summary, the process results in a slight decrease in the angular momentum of the black hole, which corresponds to a transference of energy to the matter. So, uh, whatever negative mass energy is, I guess, so if you're accurate enough to ride that line and break apart right at the right moment, then as a What would it be um, as a phenomenon, as a feature of that local area in space-time around the black hole, as a, a characteristic of the black hole's behavior? If you tapped into that at the exact right time, the black hole would... Do I understand that right? I probably don't because it sounds like something uh, quantum ASMR might be able to help me with at some point. as it can be arranged to have greater mass energy than the original piece of matter. I guess it has something to do with uh, having having its mass, ha like put, cutting it in half, halv halving, having its mass, and uh, the fact that you're sacrificing half of the mass and um, ejecting the other half with, I don't know, four times the momentum or the um, velocity, acceleration that it, yeah, the velocity that it originally had, thereby doubling the uh, momentum. That's, that's the most sense I can make out of it, and it probably isn't even sensical. Um, star lifting is a process where advanced civilizations could remove substan substantial portion of the star's matter in controlled form. And uh, as you can hear, my voice is starting to give out a little bit, so before it gets raspy, and uh, maybe I'll just switch to whispering. Of 
tap into the energy of supermassive black holes that of course are located at the centers of galaxies. White holes, if they exist, theoretically could provide large amounts of energy from collecting the matter a white hole. It's not a bleached black hole. I'm sorry, I stumbled across an anal bleaching YouTube channel the other day. It was, uh, that was very funny. How seriously they take their job. And I apologize if you were sleeping and you just woke up to the phrase anal bleaching on a video about the Kardashev scale. My apologies. This whole white hole is a hypothetical region of space-time, which cannot be entered from the outside, although matter and light can escape from it. In this sense, it is the reverse of a black hole.
which means that it's a person's life um, span would be much longer in a high, very dense gravitational field. And uh, yeah, maybe that's where I'll end this video. So uh, I suppose what they're saying there is that the existence of a white hole which would be uh, the, in effect, the opposite of a black hole. You, you, in, in trying to understand the dynamics of space-time and uh, objects in relation to that phenomenon, you would have to consider the, the time dilation created from relativistic effects, like gravity would well if it if it slows time the closer you get then in effect objects the closer they get to the white hole which they cannot enter because it's a one way exit sign street one way road exiting opposite direction um, it's saying that the objects would be so long to eventually reach the white hole that by the time they got there this could be you know trillions of years in objective time absolute time fictional absolute time that it would by then become a black hole so Jesus I don't understand that I mean surface, it, it makes sense that of how a, uh, a how the time could be stretched out so long that eventually the map the objects do finally meet the white hole. I don't understand how it converts to a black hole. But, um, no, um, um, I won't waste too much time capturing the energy of gamma ray bursts. It's another theoretically possible power source for a highly advanced type 3 galactic civilization. The emissions from quasars can be readily compared to those of small active galaxies and could provide a massive power source if collected. So, I'll leave you with this thought, is that uh, Isaac Arthur that uh, the the most advanced you know type 3 type civilizations that would be billions of years old could eventually uh, well I guess trillions uh, because the scenario he, he played out on his channel Seriously, check it out if, if you're interested in this stuff. Isaac Arthur, so cool. Is that if all the stars had diffused or dissolved and um, their life cycles had been spent, all their fusion is uh, over. And the only essentially active celestial object after the universe had expanded to such a large degree that entire galaxies are no longer in sight of one another. They're well beyond each other's event horizon. Um, universal event horizon. And it gets to the point where even galaxies themselves are being ripped apart 
the expansion of space um, due to the that unexplained expansion of space that uh, Hubble discovered they think that the last thing that civilizations would be able to tap into for energy would in fact be massive black holes at the centers of their respective galaxies so he proposed that, uh, in fact, they would have, at that point, and it's literally unimaginable, but somehow he does, he proposes that they would have a, a one scenario. seconds 
Thanks.